I'd like to move on here from forgiveness to being forgiven, and let's understand what is required for that. And it's really very simple. Uh, what is required for being forgiven is just to honestly ask. Just honestly ask. Very simple. And uh, some of Jesus' teachings about that uh, in Luke 18, 9 and following, uh, one of the things that really hurts us is trusting in ourselves that we are righteous. And that'll do it. <laughs> uh, that'll put a, just put a stop to it right there, because when God sees us in that condition, he more or less just sort of says, well, let's see how you do. <laughs> So here we have a person, uh, two, verse 10 of Luke 18. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax gatherer. Now, a tax gatherer was not a nice person. It was not thought to be a good person, a bad person. Uh, we could substitute words like traitor uh, quizzling old words that refer to someone who has gone to work for the other side. And not only that, but they were crooked. I mean, they took much more than they, than they were supposed to take because it was a sort of free enterprise operation. They gathered taxes and they had to give so much to the government, but whatever they could get over that was gravy. And you see this in the case of Zacchaeus and others that uh, are in the scripture tax together. The Pharisee, now the Pharisee is the one who trusted in himself that he was righteous and viewed others with contempt. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank thee, I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on all that I get. But the tax gatherer, standing at some distance away, that's the behavior of a person who is regarded as unclean, was unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He didn't stand on his qualifications at all. He just said, God, be merciful. Now, that's the kind of God who is at the center of this universe. We live in a Trinitarian universe. The ultimate reality is a community inseparable of persons so inseparable that they're just one. And the nature of this one, which is God, is to give when he is asked. And really we need here to put forgiving in the larger context of giving. God is a giving God. He just gives. And he teaches us to be the same way. He, he says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. See, we have the wrong idea. And we, we, we have it because we misunderstand the nature of of God and of reality. Give. Yeah. Giving is good practice for forgiving. Just giving. To give means turn it loose. Turn it loose. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men, women, boys and girls liberally and doesn't scold them. 
James 3.17. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally, and upbraideth them not, the old language says. <laughs> to braid you up meant to scold you, <laughs> straighten you out. No, 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 no. God doesn't do that. He says, sure. Okay? Now, you, you, you see, the problem with the Pharisee is they always go at it trying to engineer something. They think they've got to impress God. They think that somehow there's got to be a catch. The only catch is just ask. Just ask. What would you like from God? James said, you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask. Jesus said, ask, it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. That's the way to do it. And don't give up. Just keep asking, keep giving, keep forgiving. And as you do that, you will find the abundance of this God who simply looks at this man down here, this little guy coming in, self-condemned. You know, I don't have you ever, have you, have you ever smooched your breast? He was beating his breast. When do people do that? I mean, not ritually. In what kind of state of mind is a person who says, Ah! What, what is their state of mind? <laughs> Frustration. Anguish. Despair. You see. That's honest feeling is what I'm really getting at. This is honest feeling. This is a person who is being honest before God. I am hopeless. So, you know, you, you know you, do you know God's street address? God's address is the end of your rope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wherever your rope runs out, that's where God is. As long as you've got some rope, but when your rope runs out, that's when you smite your breast. I heard some lady talking on the radio to, uh, this week who had a beautiful line for it. She said she was talking about how one day she was so sick and tired of trying to make things work that she just finally got down before God and said, I give up. And she said, the Holy Spirit said, really? <laughs> she said, uh, she said, and there was excitement in his voice. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, see, that's where we get forgiveness. And we get forgiveness, of course, because of the great heart of God that plays itself out in history and culminates on the cross where Jesus died and where his blood ran out and he gave up his life in the grip of sin because what killed him was sin. No person killed him. He gave up his life. Okay. And in that moment, it's like God saw man in the form of his son. I encourage people to try not to get too involved in theorizing this event, but to just accept the fact that on the cross, this wonderful God-man, Jesus Christ, died for us. That's it. 
And because of that event, which was seen from the foundation of the world, and which was never absent and will never be absent from God's mind, because of that, all one has to do is say, God, forgive me. Forgive me. Confession. Now, someone says, well, but what about repentance and how, how, how serious must you be and so on? You know, one mustn't uh, sort of uh, put too fine a calibration on all these matters. The main thing is honesty. Honesty. Tearing away all the pretense and just being who we are. We, we need to talk, you see, a little bit about confession here because it is confession that allows the work of restoration to begin. That's true between, between people, isn't it? And the point you were raising earlier relates to this and uh, now we need to talk a little bit about it because uh, it is this tr in a certain sense it is true that the transaction of forgiveness requires both sides. It, if that is to be completed and the healing is to begin, both sides must be involved in it. And that's why God calls us to open up, you see, that wonderful 51st Psalm again. Uh, the teaching in John 4. God is seeking those who would worship him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? That just means God is looking for people who are willing to just be exactly what they are before him. Just to be exactly what they are, including whatever they may have done wrong. That's worshiping him in spirit and in truth. The spirit is that innermost part of the self, the heart, the character, where you and I, as it were, sit at the controls of our lives as much as possible. That innermost part where our secret thoughts and our feelings are all there before us. And confession means that we come before God at that level. And then we come before one another at that level. Because the healing that we need is one that corrects all of our relationships and enables us to be honest and open and translucent before others in our family, in our church, and perhaps in our church before in our family. Because in a very real sense, the church is the is the starting point for this because here we have people uh, who have come before God and have smitten their breasts and have been honest and just say I am this person but then it goes beyond that and confession uh, is the condition under which we began to open up ourselves to healing in all of its dimensions. A very real moment in my own life was when, as a student at college, I had to confess before God that I had cheated on an exam. And it could have meant my expulsion. And I had to work that all through. But I had to go to the professor and say what I had done. That was a, an incredible thing that happened in my life at that time in response to that. But you cannot come before God without clearing the decks. And that involves relationships to others as well. This man spoke openly. He spoke openly. Of course, he wasn't respectable anyway. 
So in a sense, he had it easy. Uh, but when we are respectable, and yet we've done what is wrong, until we own up to that in an appropriate way, and I'm not talking about broadcasting it from the rooftops. It, I, I hadn't planned to spend time talking about this this morning uh, in detail, so I'll just say in an appropriate way. Uh, we have opened ourselves up and we're no longer pretending, then the healing can begin. We need to move on then from being forgiven to forgiving. Um, because what Jesus is teaching amounts to is that until we have come to the place to where we have we are forgiving as we are forgiven, we really haven't got the point. And uh, one of our problems in our churches in America today is that we've separated uh, things that go together. And uh, we believe that, for example, we can be forgiven uh, because of some transaction that occurs possibly in heaven that has nothing to do with our lives. But there's not a single show of that in any part of the scriptures. Because when we enter into forgiveness, we enter with our whole lives. Uh, Jesus teaches quite sternly about this. Uh, he has parables and he has uh, didactic uh, teachings in, for example, in Matthew 6, after teaching, um, uh, he teaches about prayer here. And uh, in Luke, the Luke version of the same passage, he relates it, that's Luke 11, he relates it to forgiveness. Forgiveness is not something that we just receive. We pray in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our sins, our trans transgressions, and our trespasses, uh, and as we forgive others. See, it's a, it's a whole, it's a kind of totality. Uh, in a great statement on uh, prayer in uh, Mark 11, uh, he gives this all breathtaking statement about prayer. Uh, this is after he had cursed the fig tree and it had withered. And he says, in response to the astonishment of the disciples, in verse 22 of Mark 11, he says, have faith in God. But really, the language there is, have the faith of God. Uh, Truly, I say to you, whoever shall say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Now, we want to put this together with the, with the emergence of the picture of a whole life involved in God's way of acting, in, go, in what God is doing. It will be granted to him. Mm. Now, Jesus never moved a mountain by prayer. As far as I know, no one in history has ever moved a mountain by prayer. I think what you want to understand is that this is Jesus' way of saying, if it's appropriate, there is nothing that cannot be done through prayer. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And um, now then, he ties that directly into forgiveness, and we want to pay attention to the connection. Verse 25, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. Anything against anyone. The picture here is of a person for whom there is absolutely no one unforgiven in their lives. And we need to work on that. No one unforgiven in, in their lives. Because... Many times prayer is hindered for a lack of engagement of the will with what God is doing and God's way of doing things. Prayer is hindered. Prayer is not sending in orders to Susan Roebuck. 
Uh, prayer is not dropping the money in the Coke machine. When we pray, we are involved with God's action. And to be involved with God's action, we have to be totally free of unforgiveness. Because he's not in the business of unforgiveness. He's in the business of forgiveness. And although there may be a point at which, and I believe there is a point at which he gives up on some people, still, it's not because of him. That's the point, as some writers have said, at which he says to the individual, thy will be done. And he gives them up to their own will. Still, he's in the business of forgiveness. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, who is in heaven, forgive your transgressions. And that teaching is given elsewhere uh, in the scriptures. And there's a parable in Matthew 18, which I just refresh your memory on because I know that you, I can tell that you people here know your scriptures pretty well. And in Matthew 18, 21 and following, you have Peter hearing, he's, he's heard Jesus' teachings about uh, forgiveness. And um, I, I think he must have been kind of proud with the answer he had come up with. In verse 21 of Matthew 18, then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Wow. And Jesus must have looked at him and said, wow, Peter, that's good. Seven times. But Jesus said, I say to you, not up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. And you understand that he wasn't saying there that with the number 491, <laughs> you would not forgive. But rather, that was his just, he's, he's taking the number seven and giving a nice multiple of it. What he's really saying is, always forgive. Always. Always forgive. And then he goes on to give a parable of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the parables of the kingdom of heaven are always stories meant to illustrate how things work in the kingdom of the heavens. How does God deal with people, in other words? When you're under the will of God, you're living in God's world, how does God deal with them? And, uh, and actually, first of all, it is, a, it is a parable about the generosity of God in forgiving. Um, you remember that uh, you, a slave uh, comes and uh, owes a lot of money and uh, verse 26 says, have patience, I will repay you everything. Now, the response in the next verse is so typical of God. This is like the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son cooked up the scheme. He said, I'll go back to my father and I will tell him, you know, I just want to be one of your servants. But, of course, he didn't even get to tell that story when he got back, did he? And he was reclaimed as a son. And here, the slave says, give me time. And verse 27, the Lord of the slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. He just wrote it off. He didn't give him time. See, that's the generosity of God. Now then, of course, this fellow didn't get the message. And as he went out, he found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a tiny fraction of what he'd just been forgiven and grabbed him by the neck and began to choke him and saying, pay back what you owe. And his fellow slave lay down and began to entreat him, have patience, I will repay you, exactly the same words. And verse 30, he was unwilling, went and threw him in prison until he should pay back the debt. Well, of course, the word got around. And you remember how the story came out. Uh, so I, I need not repeat it for you. Verse 35. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you does not forgive 
his brother from your heart, from your heart. You'll notice the key to the forgiving was compassion. He had compassion upon him and forgave him. Now, this was a case where mercy was appropriate and mercy triumphed over the debt that was had to be paid. Jesus is very conscious of this, and he teaches of it constantly. And so what we want to understand now is that being in the flow of forgiveness, we step into it by confession, by simple asking. When we actually do that, then we are part of a larger whole that carries us into forgiveness. We can't, but let me put it like this. If we, with the vivacity of um, the man who smote his breast, shall we say, if we have received forgiveness, with that clarity of mind, we will immediately understand that, we, that forgiveness is for us to give to others. We will immediately understand that. If we have been forgiven, we will forgive. Now, we may not have that clarity about it. And we may have been given a message that emphasized only God's forgiveness for us. And we may not understand how that relates to our forgiveness of others. And if that's true, then we will be deprived of the blessing of passing that forgiveness on to others. And we will not learn how to live in an ambiance of forgiveness. So you actually don't have to be unforgiving of people very long in order to forgive them. I, uh, some time ago, I was worn out and dragging in from some trip and riding the flyway to Van Nuys and happened to be seated in front of a couple who had decided with their words to take the skin off of one another. And they were just going at him. And I, uh, as I often do, uh, when I'm traveling and or have time, I was uh, I was saying the Lord's Prayer. I was meditating on the Lord's Prayer, and I was going over the part about forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And the Lord said to me, "Why don't you forgive them?" Because I was sitting there, irritated with them, and and thinking how terrible it is. Because this was a case where. Obviously, these people, man and woman, had been together a long time, and they knew how to really take one another apart and had long practiced it. And I didn't like to see it or hear it, and so I was irritated. And I was able to drop that. And we don't have to be mad at people for a while before we forgive them. We can live in an ambiance of forgiveness that takes care of things as they come up. And uh, that's a wonderful secret to learn. That's a part of the life that's given to you. As, as a follower of Christ, you can simply learn not to take the burden up. You don't have to be unforgiving a while before you forgive. Just drop it when it hits you. And that, I think, gives us a picture of what our life could be like, because then we're immediately set free. We're immediately set free from carrying that burden of anger and retaliation, um, often affecting the whole environment of the two or more people involved and affecting other people because, you know, when these things are going, they drag other people in. And we can just simply step aside from that. We need never take it up. Never need to take it up. 